Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's 6 6 16. Here are top stories. Tonight. What's inside the billionaire bug out bag? After that, how special interest groups are taking advantage of June 6th. And our reporters are shoved away outside of a migrant camp. That's next. You speak English? No. Where are y'all from? What country? Afghanistan. Afghanistan? Yeah. When did y'all move here? Uh, Germany, yeah, good, yeah. Germany, you like it? Yeah, good, yeah. What's up? What's wrong? Right. Okay. Hey, to make an interview only without permission, uh, express permission. Okay. You need express permission before you do those. Sure. Okay. Hey, why don't here? This is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Today we're going to talk about Brexit, Bilderberg, and a billionaire space race that's developing. Now these are all related. We're going to be checking in with our reporters, Rob Dew and others, who are at the Bilderberg conference in Europe. We're also going to be talking about the issues of Brexit as that day gets closer. And of course, the European Union that Britain is looking to exit from is a creature of Bilderberg. But where is world government going to go next? After they consolidate things on Earth, will they set up headquarters in outer space? I think there's a good case that can be made for that. So we're going to take a look at this new space race that's developing with billionaires. And this last weekend, the Drudge Report had an article that I think brought this to a head. What we're seeing here is a new Sputnik moment. And let me give you an idea of what's happening here. This is the commercialization of space, the privatization of space. And this is something that's going to be done presumably by a few billionaires. Maybe it'll be what they're talking about at Bilderberg in addition to the British exit. This article from the Wall Street Journal says U.S. set to approve a moon mission by a commercial space venture. Now, this is setting up a new... Uh, I guess you could call it a precedent, working through the regulatory issues of allowing a private corporation to send something to the moon. They say U.S. officials appear poised to make history by approving the first private space mission to go beyond Earth's orbit, according to people familiar with the details. The government's endorsement would eliminate the largest regulatory hurdles to plans by a company called Moon Express, a relatively obscure space startup, to land roughly 20-pound package of scientific hardware on the moon sometime next year. And of course, these regulatory hurdles are going to present a greater uh, chain than the, the gravity that holds this thing to the Earth. These people haven't really even perfected their technology yet or, or gotten very far with it, and yet they've got to clear these regulatory hurdles. Now, this is all part of a competition for Google's Lunar X Prize. It offers a first prize of $20 million to the first people that can land a package on the moon that will traverse its surface, transmit photos and videos back to the Earth. Now, it wasn't very long ago that that $20 million prize was only a fraction of what it would cost to get something to the moon. That is changing very rapidly. And at the same time, we're seeing this happen. We have seen Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com have a conference last week at a Recode conference talking about technical issues, talking about, and of course, the thing that usually made, uh, made the biggest splash in the news was his comments about Trump via his uh, paper, The Washington Post. But I thought the most interesting moment in it was when he talked about his plans for what he was going to do in space. And as I said, I think we have a Sputnik moment here. You remember 1957, Russia launches the first man-made artificial satellite. It created a panic in the United States. It created the beginning of the space race, 1957. For the next 12 years, there was a race to try to get to the moon first. The official story was we won in 1969. And yet, what happened? We had the federal government essentially stop at that point, shut down everything, destroy and dismantle all the rocket engines, took away the uh, plans of that, and absolutely did nothing. Now, there was a generation of scientists and engineers, my generation, Jeff Bezos' generation. Our imagination had been caught by space exploration, by the possibilities of colonization, and we wanted to know what, what's going to happen next. And we're going to talk about where this is all headed. But first, I want to talk about the other people that are in this race. Of course, we've got Paul Allen, who was a partner in the startup of Google. Also, we have uh, Richard Branson, who has um, Virgin Air. The two of them seem to be focused primarily, like many of these companies, on the business of setting, launching satellites and doing some near-Earth space tourism. 
Then you have Elon Musk. Elon Musk is looking at this as kind of a Jor-El escape plan. He's openly talked about the many disruptive technologies that could destroy our Earth. Artificial intelligence that could get out of control. Robots that could get out of control. Uh, natural catastrophes that could happen. And so he's looking to set up a colony on Mars. He's a bit of a romantic, if you will. He's looking for something to, uh, to go and colonize another planet. Jeff Bezos, however, I think is much more calculating. He's looking at this not so much as the ultimate prepper move like Elon Musk is, like a billionaire's bug out bag. That's essentially what these rockets are in Elon Musk's uh, mind. And perhaps Jeff Bezos is looking at that as well, but I think he has some economic designs on this issue. And that's why I want to talk about space colonization and what we saw when I was in college, when he was in high school. Now, the space program that we had initially, of course, was run by the government. It was run with a Nazi scientist that they brought over with Operation Paperclip, Werner von Braun and others. These were scientists who had created the V-2 rocket program to attack London. Uh, they brought them over to run our space program. Now, it was pretty predictable 40 years ago that the government wasn't going to do anything. The government had set up this goal of getting to the moon, and they said they got there, and now we don't have anything else to do, so let's just dismantle the program. And yet there was much that could have been done. But when we look at what Obama has done, this is the ultimate nadir, if you will, of the space program. When we had in 2010, his NASA administrator, Charles Bolden, said that when he became, and here's a quote, when I became NASA administrator, Obama charged me with three things. One, he wanted me to help re-inspire children to want to get into space and math. He wanted me to expand our international relationships. And third, and perhaps foremost, Obama wanted me to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world and to engage much more with the dominantly Muslim nations to help them feel good about their historic contributions to science, math, and engineering. There you go. There's your participation trophy. And apparently, that is now the mission of NASA, to hand out participation trophies to Muslims and to get children interested in going into science and math. No more space exploration. And that was very predictable. That was predictable 40 years ago. And let me just interject this. If you want to feel good about your culture, uh, yes, the Muslims created algebra. But it was calculus and physics that was created by Isaac Newton, a Christian creationist, okay? So there's your participation trophy for you Christians. Now, those of us who are looking at this, and again, uh, Jeff Bezos was a valedictorian of his class as an 18-year-old. He made it clear that he was already taking a look at this, and this is what he said he wanted to do when he grew up. He said he wanted to build space hotels, amusement parks, and colonies for two or three million people who would be in orbit. He said the whole idea is to preserve the Earth, he told the newspaper. The goal was to be able to evacuate humans, the planet would become a park. And that's essentially where he is now. And I'm gonna play some clips from Jeff Bezos. And we're gonna talk about his very different view of space versus Elon Musk, or some of the people who are looking at it as a near-term satellite business, or Elon Musk who's looking at it as a bug out opportunity. He has what I believe is essentially the ultimate Agenda 21 design for the Earth. But before I do, let me back up to what gave him, gave me, this vision of space colonization. Gerard K. O'Neill wrote a book in the 1970s called High Frontier. Now, he was a physicist. He had created uh, particle ring storage for nuclear tests. He had also created something called a mass driver. Now, if you look at this picture, this straight line right here that's running up this way, that's a picture, an artist's rendering of what a lunar manufacturing colony would look like. The mass driver is a way to launch material into space. They're going to create, and his idea was to create very large cylinders. They call them O'Neill cylinders. These cylinders would be five miles in diameter, 20 miles long, and what they would do is connect the two counter-rotational so that they did not get any torque off of them. And we're going to talk about where these colonies would be located. That's very key to this. They wanted to get them close to the moon. Because by using these mass drivers, they would not have to use expensive rocket, rocket launches from either the Earth or from the moon. They could just send it out with an electromagnetic railgun is essentially what this technology is. And you've seen that with the uh, latest uh, Navy railguns that we have out there. So they would just mine the material on the Earth, presumably free of EPA regulations until the EPA caught on. And then they would launch this 
uh, finished material or raw material up to a special place in space. Now, what are these special places? They're called Lagrange Libration Points. And there you see a picture of a uh, manufacturing colony in space. But let's go to the picture of the Lagrange Libration Points. Now, whenever you've got two planetary bodies, it could be, as we see in this image, it looks like you've got the sun in the center and the Earth on the side, or it could be the Earth in the center and the Moon on the side. You get these five points that we have on this diagram here. Now, the key ones that are interesting as far as the space colonization are concerned are spots L1, let me get my weatherman thing here going, L1 and L2 over here. Those are close to the Moon. And while they won't stay, objects that are put there won't stay there indefinitely like they will down at L5 and L4, anything that you put in those two areas those are actually totally gravita gravitationally neutral. They're, they cancel out the forces from the two bodies at L4 and L5. But L1 and L2 are the ones that are most interesting for space colonization, for space manufacturing. Let's show the other picture here that shows how these things fall off. When you look at this and you look at that pit, that actually gives you an idea that there's a gravitational pull, that those balls are going to fall off there. So you have to expend energy to keep L2 and L1 in place uh, you don't have to spend any energy for L4 and L5. They'll stay in place. Now, the key thing is, is that when you start to do manufacturing in space, you can have access to infinite cold or infinite heat just by painting things black or white. Okay, you can absorb all the solar radiation without any interference from an atmosphere. And these massive cylinders that they're talking about, first they began talking about, well, let's do some spheres. They had Bernal, Bernal spheres that were proposed by some scientists at Sanford. Uh, those would be rotating to give you gravity, but it would only have full gravity at the equator. From there, they went to these kind of toroidal spheres. And we've seen this portrayed in the movies. In Elysium, they had a toroidal sphere that uh, they put there. And of course, uh, the, and there's a picture of the artist's renderings. These are from the 1970s. And of course, these have inspired numerous science fiction movies. They've reproduced this very accurately in some of the latest movies. But the key, one of these uh, space colonies, was the uh, O'Neill Cylinder, because that was so large. It was, as I pointed out before, five miles in diameter, 20 miles long. It had an atmosphere in it that would actually have weather. There would be some control over that weather, of course, but it would also have so much air in it that would produce, that it would provide uh, protection from radiation. So this captured everybody's idea, uh, imagination, saying we can do something really huge, very impressive. We can save the Earth, because remember, Earth Day had started not too long before that. And I think that's all reflected in Bezos calling his space uh, company Blue Origin. Maybe he's just out to save the environment. Maybe he truly believes all this stuff. Or maybe he's like some of these other people who is using the idea of sustainable development as a way to lock us down, to keep us from doing anything. I want to go to some of the quotes that he had now from this uh, interview that he had with the Recode Conference. So first, Bezos sells us the idea of a sustainable Earth. The way we will protect this planet is by going out into space. And you don't want to live in a retrograde world. You don't want to live on an Earth where we have to freeze population growth reduce energy utilization. And by the way, it would be completely immoral of us to say, well, we'll just kind of freeze energy utilization where it is, because the other seven billion people who are just now coming online to more energy usage, they, they're gonna want what we have. Notice that he says, we could have to freeze a population, or we might have to starve you of energy, but I got a better idea. We'll give you, we'll let you live uh, this prosperous life, we'll give you the energy and the manufactured goods, but." We will manufacture them. We will go to the stars. You will stay here on Earth. What he's selling is Agenda 21, folks. Remember, Agenda 21, the agenda for the 21st century from the UN, has now been renamed Agenda 2030, a plan for sustainable development. This is his idea of sustainable development. And underlying that are a lot of Malthusian principles saying that we would have to cover the entire worth, world with solar panels if we continued to increase our energy usage at this rate. That's a bunch of nonsense, okay? We're gonna have different forms of energy. We'd even have better solar panels if that was going to be the only form of energy that we're going to be allowed. But let's listen to what else he has to say because this is even more sinister. All of our heavy industry will be moved off planet and Earth will be zoned residential and light industrial. And that just makes a lot of sense. You, you shouldn't be 
doing heavy industry on Earth. Do you get that? We're going to zone Earth as residential and light industrial. People are laughing, but he's not joking. Who's going to have the high ground? Who's going to have the ultimate eminent domain? It's going to be people like Jeff Bezos. He purchased the Washington Post. And it was interesting in that interview, he also said, hey, the Washington Post was essentially a little colloquial uh, newspaper. I'm turning it into a global news source. And of course, he has a tremendous amount of influence with laws there in Washington with that, of course. And when we look at Bilderberg, which is going to be coming up, we're going to talk about that in the next segment, as well as Britain trying to get out of the creature of Bilderberg. Remember that Jeff Bezos attended in 2011 and 2013, and when we talked about it back in 2013, we said this at InfoWars. He said, for the Bilderberg gang, the idea of owning space and being able to pick and choose who gets to leave this planet when they get done sucking it dry must be awfully attractive. Look, Bezos is working towards monopolizing the retail business with Amazon. Perhaps what he'll do if he gets through with this plan is monopolize manufacturing in space, manufacturing it in L1, and then just dropping it to you when you order it on Amazon Prime because you won't be allowed to manufacture anything. When we come back, we're going to talk about Bilderberg and we're going to talk about the effort to get out of what Bilderberg created in Britain with Brexit. Stay with us. Uh, Tucker Carlson, great to have you here with us. Hey, Alex, thanks for having me. Wow, where do you want to start with the whole uh, Facebook situation? Well, I mean, I don't have much to add to it other than Glenn Beck behaved in a pretty self-discrediting way, I thought. Uh, it was. Just, I mean, it's interesting to see people around billionaires. I've got nothing against billionaires. I'm impressed by people who make their own fortunes, of course. But I also don't feel the need to slavishly suck up to them, to lick their boots, and he does. So, <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually talked to somebody else that was there, and they said the same thing that you said. How many people total, uh, refresh folks' memory, where did you meet? What was it like? We met at Facebook HQ outside San Francisco, um, probably 15 people. Uh, some of them you would recognize, some you wouldn't. Um, and basically we listened as, uh, as Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg and Peter Thiel um, and a couple of the top engineers over at Facebook explain that they're really worried that they're gonna be perceived as liberal. They understand that you know they're mostly liberals who work there, of course, that's the pool from which uh, they fish. And, um, and so they, they think it hurts their business if they're perceived that way. And so they're gonna try to be uh, perceived to do everything they can to make conservatives believe they're not discriminated against them. You know, it was kind of what you'd expect. What I didn't expect was to see Glenn Beck stand up and say, you know, you're just a, a remarkable innovator, you're an amazing person, and anyone who criticizes you is obviously a fascist. And um, it was, you know, it was ridiculous. He, he, he humiliated himself, I thought. He also said that Zuckerberg looks you in the eye all the time. That's what a psychopath will do. I get in German <laughs> culture, they also look in the eye. I, I look folks in the eye a lot, but uh, it, it makes people uncomfortable sometimes. So I start looking away. It's not that uh, I'm I'm trying to hide something. It's that for for whatever reason I found when I look people in the eye too long, uh, they start basically you know bumbling around. <laughs> they do. It's you know in some cultures it's considered really uh, an invitation to physical violence. It's considered way too assertive, too aggressive. Um, I didn't notice him looking at me at the eye in the eye. I was sort of looking at Sheryl Sandberg and Peter Thiel and who I you know Zuckerberg was fine. I, I didn't have a strong reaction to one way or the other. Uh, but there were more interesting people in the room, in my view. Now, I don't normally go off people's looks, but if we pull up a photo of Zuckerberg. Oh, I do. This, he, I, I'm, I'm being sarcastic. I, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, sure. He does look like he could actually play Nosferatu without any prosthetic fake teeth. I mean, he does have vampiric teeth. <laughs> that is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> he, you know, he didn't go for my neck, I'm proud to say. You know, we're not prepared for this, but guys, just type in his name. It's like the official photo they put out with his face leering. He looks completely scary. And, of course, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here, but getting serious. Uh, tell us what you really think about Glenn Beck, because I'm not here just to bash other talk show hosts. I don't really do that. I, I read a lot of what Glenn Beck covers as a supposed libertarian. But he wanted to be the leader of the whole movement. He did a lot of stuff behind the scenes on affiliates we were on and with, with sponsors. I mean, uh, this guy really, I, I learned, has vendettas for everybody and thinks he's the king of the universe and should run everything. I was told that by people at Fox. One time I was there to uh, go on other shows, and the Fox high-level producer, a name everyone would know, has their own show on Fox, but also produces stuff, came over, had a steak with me at lunch, or part of a steak, they had a smaller steak, and I sat there after I'd just been on The View, 
And he looked right at me and said, Glenn Beck is climbing the walls that you're about to be let in to be on a bunch of shows. And I said, well, I've already been offered a show. They want me to do a pilot with ManCal. I turned that down last year. And I said, why does he care? And he goes, look, trust me. He runs the whole place. He's probably going to get kicked out. He's crazy. Uh, but he, he thinks he's Jesus. And now that was the quote. Now I've been told that by so many others. What was your take on Glenn Beck? Well, I mean, I, my, my general view of Glenn Beck is that he's super talented. I mean, he's much he's much more talented than I am. That's for sure. Radio, as you know, is great preparation for any kind of broadcasting because you have to fill all this air by yourself. And it takes a talented man to do that. Again, more talented than I am. Glenn Beck is a really talented guy. But when he started to conflate his own radio career with some sort of religious mission, you know, he lost me. And I mean, I'm a pretty mainstream Episcopalian. Maybe that's maybe it's my fault. Maybe, I didn't understand it. But there was this mystic element that crept it's cultic. In. To his rhetoric, I mean, it made me uncomfortable, I will say that. He had this weird rally on the mall. It wasn't clear what it was about, but it had something to do with elevating him as a spiritual leader, and, and that's where he kind of lost me. I'm a kind of meat and potatoes, cable news guy, journalist. I've done it for 25 years, pretty straightforward. You know, here's the story. Here's what I think it means. I mean, it's, you know, I, I'm not here to redeem people or to save them from hell. Well, the really creepy part is him saying he has the only answer and that, and that Cruz is this anointed one and that the children are their new priest, and that if we don't do what they say, we're going to hell, that is Jim Jones territory. Well, it scared the hell out of me, I gotta say. And again, I, I don't wanna be judgmental, but it, it freaks me out when people talk like that. I mean, this is politics. The point of politics is by definition, it's a secular endeavor. We're trying to solve differences without violence, without, refer without reference to the hereafter. We're trying to do this in a sort of reasonable way using logic, reason, right? And when you all of a sudden start imputing religious motives um, or significance to the politicians you support, then it gets way too heavy and weird for me. And also, by the way, the implication is if my guy is the Messiah or I'm the Messiah and you disagree with him or me, you're damned. You're literally looking at eternal damnation. And that's just a level of discourse I'm not comfortable with because once you believe the person you're competing against is not just wrong but evil, it justifies almost any kind of action, including violence. And so it makes me uncomfortable. Sure, and that's why the reason he got suspended off Sirius XM, and more and more I have to say I agree with it, because it's the premeditated nature of it. He's powerful. He's got tens of millions of listeners. He's messed with me hardcore. I mean, like like not even the government's done this much stuff as, 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 as people have told me back behind the scenes. And I've experienced losing the affiliates and, 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 and you know the sponsors and stuff with him personally trying to lean on me over the years. And I can't prove all of that, but he's attacked me and said I'm dangerous and said I shouldn't be on the air and stuff like that. So, so he's on record with some of it. I, he moved to Texas where I'm at. I mean, he copies a lot of stuff we do, but twist it. But he said once, you know, let me on the stage with Trump. I'm going to stab him a bunch. I wouldn't stop. Then he said, oh, I didn't mean that about Trump. And then he has this other guy on to say, well, we mean this hypothetically, but somebody needs to take him out, Trump. And it's the sneakiness of it that makes it so creepy. He's not just talking about killing Trump. He's trying to, like, say... Somebody needs to take care of this problem. Uh, okay, yeah, he needs to die, but we need to watch how we say it. Uh, and this is a guy with hundreds of millions of dollars, or at least he used to have it. That's dangerous. Well, and also in this moment, which is a very combustible moment, I mean, anybody paying any attention at all can see where this is going. There have been outbreaks of violence at Trump events. There are going to be more, unfortunately. I hope it's not going to happen, but I suspect, and everyone watching suspects that it, it will. This is exactly the moment when you need to kind of pull back a little bit Let's not talk like that because there are an awful lot of crazy people out there, as you well know, um, and some of them well, yeah, are right on the edge of action. <laughs> I was joking saying I'm one of them, but you know what? We were talking earlier about being a little bit crazy. I don't act on it, and, 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 and I'm in control of my eccentric side. These right. other people tend to get some power, <laughs> and they get more eccentric until they go off into la-la land. And I'm personally worried that Glenn Beck has something like a borderline personality disorder. Uh, I well, personally, uh, you know, in, in study and life have, have 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 researched that. Let's just say I read a few books on it and talked to some psychologists about it but because I know some folks that have it. And let me tell you, there's some things that they diagnose that don't exist, like, you know, uh, oppositional to authority disorder or whatever. But let me tell you, schizophrenia, uh, things like uh, people that are OCD, agoraphobia, um, borderline personality disorders are basically like a grab bag of all that. And if you experience it, folks, you start recognizing it. And I think Lynn Beck really ought to get some medical help. I'm serious. Well, I think what you know, all of us need in order to maintain sanity is to have a small group of people whom we trust, who have our best interest at heart, and whom we listen to 
carefully and, and act on their advice. I mean, you, you know, you Sound need boards. we need to we need to bounce things off, folks. Well, of course, people that you actually listen to whose opinions you care about. You know, I only have three or four people in my life whose opinions I really listen carefully to. But if two or more of them tell me to do something, I do it because I know that they're Same here. If my mom, my dad, uh, right. my cousin Buckley and a few other people all of a sudden say something, I know I'm wrong and I go, OK, but that's only a couple times a year. That's exactly, that's exactly, I've had that exact experience. And the funny thing is in my life, one of them is named also Buckley, my brother Buckley. I know you've come and visited us and hung out. You're a great guy and you were just blown away. Wait, Buckley's really named Buckley. <laughs> I know, I, well, I've never met. I have a son and a brother named Buckley and I had a grandfather named Buck. I've never met anybody else with that name, but uh, Well, he it. has a name that sounds like it's something right out of the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, the Oat Monk Stratley or whatever. But, but with him, it, uh, we've tracked back both our family names, but then they were fans of William F. Buckley as well, his dad and mother, so that was the coup de grace. But uh, the Buckley and the Stratton, uh, and the Hammond, those are all family names connected. Uh, so, yeah. Who knows? That's that? amazing. Might be related. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> now, now again, Tucker Carlson here, we're looking at a massive climate of censorship. It's clearly intensifying. Yes. They're calling for it in Europe. Uh, Facebook's working with them in Europe doing it. So when Facebook says, oh, we've just got a few employees doing this, I don't, I don't really buy it. I mean, we've been given the three-day suspensions for really simple stuff like sending out uh, a link that Navy SEALs sent out about Benghazi saying, you know, she didn't act and they died with just photos of their faces. Rob Dew reporting for Infowars.com. And as you can see behind me, we're in the ruins of Castle Wolfstein. This is a medieval castle built on a large hill overlooking the town of Newmark. And I'll give you a shot of that in one second. But we were here today because we got a tip from, uh, I guess, an info warrior sent me an email saying there's a refugee center and they gave me uh, the address. We actually drove in there. Um, we had our body cameras rolling this time because, as you know, yesterday when we were in Munich and we approached the refugee center, uh, a whole crew of blue shirt people, a blue shirt clad people came out, got in our face, were uh, putting their hands in front of our cameras and just very angry that we were there just wanting to see what was going on and, and how many people, migrants were at that center. This was a much smaller house and we have a full interview with actually one of the Syrian migrants uh, came over and talked to us and we interviewed him for about 20 minutes. He spoke okay English, uh, okay German, and uh, we had a pretty interesting conversation. So I think people are gonna be really interested in listening to that. But here around me, you could see it's got really thick walls, uh, there's a big tower here, which it looks like it was recently rebuilt. And on top, they have some uh, antennas and, uh, I guess, um, you know, cellular functions and, and stuff like that. This is a very high point in the area. You can see, Josh, let's get a shot of this. You can see you have a view of the entire surrounding area. So if you were to have invaders coming or anything, you could see what was going on. And there, over there, is the town of Newmarket. And it's about 40,000 people living there. And uh, when we talked to the refugee, his name was Muhammad, he said there's about 1,000 migrants in this city, and uh, they don't feel welcome in the city. He said for various reasons, people look at them, and uh, he didn't seem to understand why. I tried to uh, talk to him about that and uh, asked him a lot of different questions. So it's going to be an interesting interview. We're going to have that. We're actually on our way to Dresden, Germany today. We started off in Munich went to some migrant centers there, met, met with the head of the German Freedom Party, and we have that interview coming up as well. We shot those on the iPhone, so those take a little, or on the uh, cannons, so those take a little bit of time to uh, get edited down, put the articles on, make it look really good, and put those up, but those will be coming up soon. But we're on our way to Dresden, Germany. Tonight, at about 6.30 in the evening, there's going to be a large protest, an anti-immigration protest that'll be taking place. They say between 3,000 and 20,000 people could show up. And with Bilderberg happening just the next, uh, in the next couple days, it's sure to be a raucous event. All right, Rob Dew here for Infowars.com. We are in downtown uh, Dresden, very near where the Bilderberg meeting is going to take place in just a few short days. And there's an anti-immigration rally going on. Uh, we heard about this yesterday from uh, Michael Stutzenberger, who's actually one of the speakers here. He's with the German Freedom Party. And I'd say there's probably three to 400 people here now. Maybe even more. It's looking pretty big. So uh, I don't know exactly what they're saying. Well, we're going to go check it out. Well, 
Pretty heavy police presence. You see, they got some kind of camera with uh, some stuff on it. Probably gonna get mad if I film that. There's Josh Owens. I have not connected with him yet, but we can. Yes, we can get ready to do that. Uh, when, what time do they want to go? Okay. So anyway, we're gonna walk around, see what's. A lot of German flags. There's a anti-Nazi flag right there. Can't even see where the speaker's at. Say they have people dressed up as Muslims. Hey, what is everybody chanting? Do you know? You don't speak English? All right. <laughs> anyway, there's a good number of people here in this square. This is, uh, we were in uh, Nuremberg this morning. Went by another area. You can probably hear what they're saying. There they are back in the, that might even be Michael Stutzenberger right there in the back. Yeah, that's who we interviewed yesterday. Gestern schon hergekommen sind. Heute Abend werden Sie im Rathaus Briefe an den Oberbürgermeister Hilbert und an die Stadträte, an alle Stadträte verteilen, damit diese Brüder aufgeklärt werden über die Amadia, was das für eine Bande ist. Ja? Und in diesem Brief, da steht folgendes. Okay, we're up here with Infowars.com. The uh, demonstration that was being held in the square. People are now marching. They were chanting Nazis out a second ago. You can see they're marching through the city of Dresden. This is Rob with Infowars.com. And uh, seems to be a very respectable group. They're being very uh, polite, but they are pissed off. They're pissed off that their country is being taken over by migrants and the resources that are being used to house and feed and protect these migrants. Uh, they're treated almost better than the citizens here. Um, so it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty crazy. This is a long, a pretty long march though. This has got to be at least 2,000 people, maybe more. And uh, we saw some Bilderberg signs. There's a sign right there. So this might be, what do you think these guys, oh look, they're flipping them off. Okay. You think we should go over there? Stay with me. I'll come right through here. Excuse me. Now the people are dancing. Anti, are uh, anti, uh, pro immigration. They're pro immigration. So it looks like your typical leftist group, the refugees welcome. And the right friends are between the Bilderbergers, and this is just a small piece, a small story how this works. When I tell, I, I 
can tell you something about the Rockefeller. I can't tell you something about Goldman Sachs. I can't tell you something about, well, Kissinger is well known, but this is how they make their politics. It's between secret closed doors. They give the views, they have the visions, the so-called visions, what they think is best, not for the world, but for themselves. Right. They set the stage and create the gentlemen's agreements that are then become policy around the world, either in trade agreements or with laws in different countries. And uh, yeah, that's why we're here to cover. Why is it important that people know? This is my final question for you. Why is it important that people know about the Bilderberg Group and what goes on and that that media should be out covering it? Why is that so important? The only thing why it's so much important is nothing nothing is going on in the world just by accident nothing it's only a question from people a few people in the world the meeting the meetings of Bilderbergers are about uh, 100 to 150 people you know everybody is so happy to be at Bilderbergers as InfoWars reporters are in Germany covering Bilderberg, we need to remember that Bilderberg, the very first meeting, they proposed not only a, a United States of Europe that had been proposed elsewhere, but it was at the very first Bilderberg meeting that they talked about having a common currency, the euro. And the euro was what really began the dissatisfaction with the European Union. And of course, that increased as they saw the open border situation that is being foisted upon them by Brussels. Now, this last week, we've had a historic turn. We've seen a gradual uh, increase. And of course, as uh, Lord Monckton was interviewed by Alex Jones, he was talking about how popular opinion was turning towards leaving the European Union in Britain with the Brexit vote coming up at the end of this month. And he says it's a steady incline and he says we expect it to uh, take over from uh, losing out to uh, the remain campaign he says we think that leave is going to soon turn positive well that happened this last weekend historic turning point brexit took a three percent lead after a huge week for the leave campaign and of course that's in two different polls they've seen a two and a three percent uh, increase now what happened to turn this around well, it was the desperate claims of Prime Minister David Cameron, as well as a uh, live television question and answer period. He's making things claims like this. Of course, he also came out and said that uh, there would be war if Britain got out of the European Union. Now he's saying that a Brexit would cause a mortgage increase. He said that yesterday. Today, he underscored that even more. He said it will be like a bomb put under the economy. Oh, you mean these bankers who created uh, this centralized economy, they're going to pull the rug out from under people, just as they did with the LIBOR exchange, the London interbank rate that they rigged? And, of course, that is the basis, the metric on which adjustable rate mortgages are based. Then you have Gordon Brown, who is the other party, uh, the Labor Party, pre uh, previous prime minister, saying that UK can only control immigration by staying within the EU. Now, everybody knows that that is not true. And, of course, Boris Johnson, the former mayor of London, has been pointing out that the only way that you're going to be able to control EU immigration, especially the Muslim immigration, if they bring Turkey into the European Union, is to leave. But it's about self-governance. That's essentially what it is. So it's a self-governance versus a global governance. That's the question before the people in Europe now. Now, of course, today is 6 6 16. And as we pointed out a week ago, we have Satanist and Los Angeles saying that they're going to use GPS to set up five points of a pentagram around L.A., essentially sanctifying it or claiming it for Satan. Who knows? OK, this is a pentagram, of course, is a star with five points. And they say we are going to encompass your entire city. Now, in the article that we had a week ago on Infowars.com from Michael Snyder, he pointed out, he said, currently in America, there's an intense competition among various belief systems, religions, philosophies, and ideologies. And so the question is, certainly the Satanists believe that they're doing something significant, whatever it is that they think that they're doing. But what's even more troubling is that we see the elites, the 
people who are running our government participating in this kind of process as well. We had an amazing ceremony that happened uh, this last uh, midweek. It was on June the 1st. It was in Switzerland. They opened up a new railroad tunnel. It's the Goddard Base Tunnel. This is the world's longest, deepest traffic tunnel. It is the first flat, low-level route through the Alps. They dug a tunnel, a couple of tunnels, straight through the mountains there. But that's an amazing engineering achievement. But look at what they did to celebrate this. Look at this footage that we've got here. You've got 600 actors on the sixth month of the 16th year of the century. Uh, there's your 666 again. But look at the satanic imagery. You've got goats, you've got topless angels, you've got people tap dancing and overalls marching like they're in a trance, these workers here. You've also got lesbian sex being performed. You've got a Baphomet character that's prancing around, simulated bestial sex. One of the most bizarre images is this topless woman with feathered wings and a giant baby head floating in midair as you've got workers groveling below her. And as I pointed out, People who were in attendance, and of course there was two different groups. There were the elites who were down inside this tunnel where most of this video footage has taken place. Uh, and then there were people who were on the surface. And you can see that large projection screen with the strange images of the uh, tunnel. Looks like it's being constructed. You got uh, workers there that are dangling and you got arms and legs twisting in a circle there. They said everybody was left open mouthed. And you had this one person saying, uh, I'm watching the uh, Swiss tunnel and this is happening. Another person says, uh, as a Swiss citizen, I apologize. Yeah, it is very disturbing to see these kinds of images. And of course, we could spend an entire program, many people have done that, unpacking all the various images that are being presented to you here in this. And what is really being foisted upon people, whether you realize this or not, you know, we have the overt symbolism of the uh, Satanist in LA. But then we have the governments who are spending massive amounts of money to show us these disgusting occultic images and just leaving it out there for you to either connect the dots or not connect the dots. You know, they do it for you in LA, but the governments don't connect the dots. That's what uh, you'll have to do for yourself. Here's John Bowne unpacking that symbology for you. The enemy, the devil, the deceiver, the accuser, get behind me satan what does satan do gets in front of you on our road to the stars satan gets in front of human development satan only gives us mutated technologies and mutated systems that control us and dumb us down in an attempt to play god and build an artificial system to predict the future the devil doesn't have omnipresence. The devil is trying to use humans made in the image of God to build a God machine to be able to understand the future and decipher everything. The devil only knows how to con people and manipulate people because he is a magician. He is a deceiver. He is a fraud. He is a lie. He is not one, one trillion what the creator is. To hell with the devil. From their ivory towers, their satanic majesties are gradually ramping up the intermittent displays of their Luciferian intentions, setting the table for the coming of their paradoxical savior, the Antichrist. The Swiss elite, with their guarded secrets, unveiled a new railway tunnel that will race through the Swiss Alps at 155 miles per hour. What appears to be normal theatrics begins as construction workers marching into the tunnel quickly morph into Luciferian symbolism. World leaders including Chancellor Angela Merkel of Germany, President Francois Hollande of France, and Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi were in attendance of the bizarre production to launch what equates to the 8.5 billion pound Gothard base tunnel. The Luciferian elite were there to witness the public mind control proceedings in plain sight, as usual. The the Daily Mail writes, the Swiss have put on one of the most bizarre opening ceremonies in history to mark the completion of the world's longest tunnel. Famed for their trains, organizers roped in more than 600 dancers, acrobats, and dramatic actors and even composed the new route's very own theme tune as they pulled out all the stops for Wednesday's inauguration at the tunnel's northern portal in Ertzfeld. Back in the United States, on the unholy day of 6-6-2016, the Los Angeles Satanic Temple publicized their demonic intentions. The LA Weekly writes, 
The group, which has 12 members, says it's heading to Lancaster on June 6th to take part in a satanic ritual, according to the statement. Members of the sect also will be in Lancaster to support local Steve Hill, billed as the first satanic temple member to run for public office. He's vying for a state senate seat. The satanic temple explained the meaning of their ritual. The pentagram is a star with five points. Using GPS technology, we will place the five points of the star so that the pentagram will encompass your entire city. When all of the points are in place, the pentagram is completed. This particular sect, with roots at Harvard and Cambridge, is decidedly intellectual. They claim, we stand up for human rights and civil rights. We get together on a social and political level. If you hadn't noticed, rituals such as these are gradually becoming commonplace. The Gnostic duality has, by degrees, snuck its way into the fabric of American society, seeking to transform the morality and ethical standards that built the United States of America into the self-indulgent Luciferian ideals of the ruling elite. With the involuntary support of millions of zombies transfixed by the spectacle. Is it not my king time to spring the trap? No, we must desecrate the soul and the flesh of the creator's creation. John Bound for Infowars.com. And that's it for tonight's news. Don't forget, tomorrow night we have a very long live edition of the InfoWars Nightly News, beginning, of course, at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.